Okay, so we have that. We have our adipose tissue. Uh, for the purposes of the lecture, we're not going to talk about how adipose is formed. Uh, we're going to assume we've got our triglyceride in the fat tissue and we need some energy because um, we are busy involved, uh, we are involved in a sporting event or, or what what. So let's break down this adipose tissue and get some ATP. So first of all, we need to hydrolyze this triglyceride in the adipose tissue and then we're going to end up having glycerol and three fatty acids. And there is a chemical reaction for you. Note that it requires three water molecules. So then these uh, fatty acids become free and these free fatty acids combine with albumin um, and albumin is a protein so technically speaking this albumin fatty acid complex is a lipoprotein and that moves through the bloodstream and is taken up by whatever target cell is, requi uh, um, is requiring it. Remember with heavy muscular exertion your blood flow increases to the muscles um, uh, reflexively and as such uh, we're going to have an increased supply of free fatty acids flushed into the muscles which are exerting the most heavily. And then the fatty acid is released from the albumin, crosses the plasma membrane and once it's inside the cell there are two things that can happen. They can either recombine with glycerol, re-esterify and make a triglyceride to so stay as a backup source or they go straight to the mitochondrion where they are breaking down. Okay, so we have a fatty acid, it's in our mitochondrion and now we're going to go through a process called beta oxidation whereby we're going to break down this fatty acid into acetyl coenzyme A. And if you remember acetyl coenzyme A, it is a component of the Krebs cycle. So what we are basically doing is smashing fatty acid into acetyl coenzyme A and then uh, donating acetyl coenzyme A to the Krebs cycle. So I'm going to discuss how the beta oxidation uh, process goes along as if it was a recipe in a kitchen and um, to t uh, then we're going to have a look at the flow diagram um, to review. So first of all we're going to need some ATP and we're going to need acyl coenzyme A synthase and then that's going to combine our free fatty acid uh, uh, molecule of coenzyme A and we're going to get fatty acyl coenzyme A. This is a two-step reaction. I'm not going to go into detail uh, into the two steps, but because it's a two-step process, it actually consumes as um, two units of energy from our ATP. And then rather than having ATP transformed to ADP, we actually have AMP. And for the sake of simplicity, we say that this reaction, ATP to AMP, loses as much energy as two ATP degrading to two ADP. So we're going to count um, this ATP molecule actually as 2 ATP because of that. Um, if you want to be very strict and very pedantic, actually the amount, what happens is that ATP converts first to ADP and then ADP converts to AMP. ADP to AMP does not release quite as much energy as the first step of ATP to ADP. Um, but for the sake of simplicity and because the numbers are near enough to each other, we round them uh, around and we say it's rather the same as 2 ATP making 2 ADP. So now we've got this fatty acyl coenzyme A and this reaction occurs on the outer mitochondrial membrane but um, beta oxidation occurs in the mitochondrial matrix so we need to find a way to get this fatty acyl coenzyme A into the mitochondrial matrix. If the fatty acid has a short enough chain um, this fatty acyl coenzyme A can actually diffuse into the matrix uh, spontaneously, but if it's one of those really long chains of carbon uh, in the fatty acid, then we're actually going to need a transport mechanism to get it through the inner mitochondrial membrane. So if it requires a transfer mechanism, we're going to react our fatty acyl coenzyme A with carnitine acyl transferase 1. That's going to form fatty acyl carnitine and coenzyme A. Fatty acyl carnitine is easily transported into the matrix 
and then within the matrix we have carnitine acyl transferase 2 which then recombines the coenzyme A with the fatty acid to once more get fatty acyl coenzyme A and then we have release and carnitine. Now uh, please note your carnitine availability is proportional to your mitochondrial numbers and your mitochondrial mass and I've mentioned earlier that with endurance training the mass of your mitochondria increases so your athletes, your endurance uh, sportsmen have higher mitochondrial mass in their muscles and therefore they have more carnitine and this leads us to a sort of paradoxical situation where your thin athletic persons who have lots of endurance training are actually better at using fat as an energy source, they're better at uh, taking up that fat tissue and making it into ATP, they're better at it, at it than obese people. You'd think that obese people, because they have so much fat, would probably rely on fat um, as their um, primary sort of energy source, but the reality is that obese people are terribly inefficient in uh, using their fatty tissue uh, to create ATP. So that's one of the benefits of uh, taking up an exercise program if you are obese. Uh, if you can um, do a little bit of endurance training, you can increase your mitochondrial mass, you become more efficient at breaking down your fat tissue. Okay, so we've finally got our fatty acids into the mitochondrial matrix and we can start breaking it down. Now fatty acid can have anything between 4 to 28 carbons and typically there will be a long sort of 4 to 28 carbon chain and what we're going to do is we're going to cut up the chain 2 carbons at a time for our beta uh, oxidation cycle. So fatty acyl coenzyme A is broken down by fatty acyl dehydrogenase we have a dehydrogenase, so that means we're going to be harvesting hydrogens from our molecule. If we're going to be harvesting hydrogens from our molecule, we need a coenzyme to collect those hydrogens. In this case, it's going to be FAD. And our end product is going to be alpha beta unsaturated fatty acyl coenzyme A. Quite a mouthful. And we're going to have FADH2. And FADH2 is going to go off the electron transport chain. Now we're going to add enol hydrase and a molecule of water to our alpha beta unsaturated fatty acyl coenzyme A and we're going to turn it into beta hydroxy acyl coenzyme A. Now we're going to add hydroxy acyl dehydrogenase. Dehydrogenase means we're going to be harvesting hydrogens from our beta hydroxy acyl coenzyme A. We're going to need a coenzyme. Our coenzyme in this case is going to be NAD and we're going to form beta keto acyl coenzyme A and we're going to get NADH plus H plus which goes off to the um, electron transport chain. Now we're going to throw in beta ketothiolase we're going to throw in another coenzyme A and what's well, guess what we're going to end up with? We're going to add we're going to end up with acetyl coenzyme A which goes off to the Krebs cycle and we're going to have fatty acyl coenzyme A, which is pretty much the same thing that we started off with right over there, fatty acyl coenzyme A. Um, but this time around, it's two carbons shorter. And this fatty acyl coenzyme A is going to again go through the whole process, again split off into acetyl coenzyme A and fatty acyl coenzyme A. And it's going to go on and on and on until it's four carbons long. Some short fat chain fatty acids may already be four carbons long when they enter the cycle. And when we have a four carbon chain molecule, it's going to go through the whole process and the end point, instead of having a fatty acyl coenzyme A and acetyl coenzyme A, we're going to have acetyl coenzyme A and acetyl coenzyme A. So we're going to, the end point of breaking down the fatty acid as a very large cycle, instead of having a fatty acyl coenzyme A, we have two acetyl coenzymes A instead. Okay, so the energy yield of beta oxidation under ideal conditions. We've already mentioned that we had to have FAD as a coenzyme and NAD as a coenzyme. These coenzymes take up hydrogen. Um, the FADH2 makes 2 ATP. NADH plus makes 3 ATP. 
and in total from the coenzymes we're going to get 5 ATP from the electron transport chain. Our acetyl coenzyme A, provided that there's enough oxaloacetate to begin with, begin with is going to enter the citric acid cycle. Each round of the citric acid cycle is going to generate um, 12 ATP and then remember we had to use up the equivalent of two ATPs to degrade our original fatty acid and uh, we subtract uh, our two ATPs from the sum of these um, processes and each round of beta oxidation will make 15 ATP under ideal conditions. Ideal conditions would include having enough carnitine uh, to transport the fatty acids, having enough enzymes, and having enough oxaloacetate to take up the acetyl coenzyme A. Okay, here's another incredibly beautiful flow diagram from my artistic pen. I'm going to start off with free fatty acids being made into fatty acyl coenzyme A. Um, to make this coenzyme A molecule, we're going to need coenzyme A, and this enzyme acyl coenzyme A synthase and in the process we break down ATP to AMP which releases the equivalent amount of energy as two breakdowns of ATP to ADP. So this is a now mitochondrial um, outer membrane. We need to get the fatty acyl coenzyme A into the mitochondrial matrix. If it's a short chain molecule it diffuses in directly if it's a longer chain molecule, it's going to need to bind to carnitine. Through carnitine acyl transfer is one, which releases the coenzyme. Um, then you've got fatty acyl carnitine, which is transported through uh, into the matrix. And then once it hits the matrix, we're going to have carnitine acyl transfer is two to take back the coenzyme A and to make fatty acyl coenzyme A. And as mentioned before, uh, endurance athletes have higher levels of carnitine. So with our fatty acyl coenzyme A, we're going to dehydrogenate it with our fatty acyl dehydrogenase. We're going to take up two hydrogens and give it to FAD to make FADH2 and end up with alpha beta unsaturated fatty acyl coenzyme A. So, um, unsaturated means that there are some carbon bonds which are missing a hydrogen, which makes sense because we've taken out some hydrogens over here. In fact, we've taken out two hydrogens, so we'd say this is probably a polyunsaturated molecule because there are two hydrogens missing, so that we had guesstimated there would be two double carbon bonds. I'm going to throw in enol hydrase. It's a hydrase molecule, so it's going to need some water. And I'm going to add water to this molecule to make beta hydroxylase coenzyme A. And there were two hydrogens added in, so probably those unsaturated bonds have become saturated uh, to make beta hydroxylase coenzyme A. And the sooner that we add hydrogens, we're going to end up extracting them again. This time we're going to ex uh, extract two hydrogens through NAD, uh, through the NAD molecule. And that's going to give us beta co ketoacyl coenzyme A. Now we're going to add beta ketothalase and throw in another coenzyme A. And then we're going to get acetyl coenzyme A. If we still have uh, four more, more carbons in our fatty acid chain, we're, we're going to get fatty acyl coenzyme A. If we're down to our last two carbons, we're going to get another molecule of acetyl coenzyme A. Okay, so we went into a lot of detail about the fatty acid breakdown, but what about that glycerol that we left behind? Well, um, glycerol kinase, an enzyme, takes ATP and converts glycerol into glycerol 3-phosphate. Gonna have some ADP left over. And this glycerol 3-phosphate is converted by glycerol phosphate dehydrogenase. We have a dehydrogenase, we need a coenzyme, NAD, and then we're going to get NADH plus uh, NADH plus H plus, which can go to the electron transport chain, and we get the dihydroxyacetone phosphate, um, which, if you remember diligently, was actually one of the components of the gluco 
of the glycolysis pathway. Um, so this can either contribute to glycolysis and be broken down via the glycolytic pathway or it can enter the gluconeogenic pathway and be reverse sort of um, engineered into glucose. And as mentioned, there are certain irreversible steps in gluconeogeni uh, gluconeogenesis. Um, so you're going to need extra enzymes um, to convert this into uh, glucose, such as fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. Okay, so let's talk about ketones, our emergency backup energy source for when we are starving, or when we are deliberately fasting, um, or if we are in a prolonged exercise situation, or if we are in a severe diabetic state. What happens, the liver is going to run out of glycogen, uh, can't make any more glucose, and then it's going to start forming ketones. And the way it makes ketones is it takes acetyl coenzyme A and converts it into a ketone and kidneys can also form ketones. And ketones can be used in the brain and the muscle as an energy source. Okay, so we're going to go into detail into ketogenesis, how ketones are made. We're going to take two of our acetyl coenzyme A's and we're going to add aceto acetyl coenzyme A thiolase. And in the end, what we're going to get is aceto acetyl coenzyme A and coenzyme A. So what we've basically done is taken the acetyl of component of the one molecule and plonked it onto an acetyl coenzyme A. So we're going to add hydroxymethyl glutaryl coenzyme A synthase and this and another acetyl coenzyme A and we're going to add this acetyl acetoacetyl coenzyme A and we're going to end up with coenzyme A and 3 hydroxy 3 methyl glutaryl coenzyme A. So we've taken yet another acetyl coenzyme A, taken the acetyl group and then plonked it onto this molecule to get this molecule. Now we're going to add a lyase enzyme, hydroxymethyl glutaryl coenzyme A lyase to split this uh, molecule and we're going to get acetyl coenzyme A and acetoacetate. And this acetoacetate um, can degrade spontaneously into acetone and carbon dioxide. And this acetone and carbon dioxide then is taken through into the blood and is excreted through the lungs. And acetone has a distinctive smell, easily converts into a gas form from a, uh, when it's uh, dissolved in liquid. So people with a lot of acetone in their blood are going to have a quite a distinctive smell on their breath. and it is the acetone that you are smelling uh, in diabetic ketoacidosis. Alternatively, um, if you have enough hydrogens and coenzymes available, we can break down this acetoacetate into beta hydroxybutyrate. Um, we're going to need a dehydrogenase enzyme. This time around, we're not going to dehydrogenate. Uh, we're not going to take hydrogens away from acetoacetate, we're actually going to take hydrogens from the NADH plus H plus and then plonk it onto the acetoacetate to form our beta hydroxybutyrate and we're going to have some free coenzyme left over. Except for the formation of acetone, um, this spontaneous degradation is irreversible. Um, so ex excluding that, all the processes I've mentioned up to this point are reversible. Okay, so beta hydroxybutyrate can enter the brain and the muscle tissue. It can then be broken down to acetoacetate uh, through the dehydrogenase molecule, which gives off NADH plus H plus, which can immediately be utilized for energy, and it can eventually be broken down, reverse engineered into two acetyl coenzyme A molecules, which can enter the Krebs cycle, provided enough oxaloacetate is present in the background. Uh, let's say as a flow diagram, um, which pre pretty much says the same thing as on the previous slide. We're going to have two acetyl coenzyme A's. We're going to have a thiolase enzyme. It's going to take away the coenzyme A and um, combine the two acetyl components to make acetoacetyl coenzyme A. And then we're going to have hydroxymethyl glutaryl coenzyme A. We're going to throw in a coenzyme, another acetyl coenzyme A. We're going to end up with. Uh, 
excess coenzyme A molecule. We're going to combine the acetyl component to acetoacetyl component over there to get 3 hydroxy 3 methyl glutaryl coenzyme A. And um, we're going to add a synthase enzyme over there to split off an acetyl coenzyme A, and we're going to get acetoacetate. And um, this can either spontaneously degrade into acetone and CO2, which is an irreversible process, or it can go into a reversible process through beta hydroxybutyrate dehydrogenase, with the help of some coenzymes, to make beta hydroxybutyrate, which is our ketone body. And our ketone body can easily pick up uh, hydrogen to make beta hydroxybutyric acid. And this is why ketone bodies contribute to acidosis. Okay, I'm sure uh, by this point you probably have put two and two together regarding oxaloacetate, but just to um, point out that you cannot completely harvest energy from lipids um, without oxaloacetate to pick up those acetyl coenzyme A molecules made from beta oxidation. To make oxaloacetate you need uh, you need pyruvate. Pyruvate is a glucose breakdown product so ironically you cannot break down fat in the absence of glucose breakdown. So it will be quite fun to completely starve yourself of glucose in the hope that um, your body can get rid of all your excess fat but in order to get rid of that excess fat paradoxically you're going to need some sort of glucose available to help break it down.